Hi there, I'm Rob Delaney, and I'm about to get in bed with Joan. I talked to her physician earlier. I understand our STDs that we both have are compatible, so there'll be no protection. Probably has a thing or two she could teach me, but I'm eager to learn. I'm Joan Rivers. The name of the show is In Bed with Joan, and let's see who's coming out of our closet today. Hello. All Hello right, there. Rob Delaney. How nice to have you. Hi there. Come sit down. Thank you. Okay. Want to take your shoes off? Yeah, I okay. feel like I don't want to damage your nice duvet. That's fine. Sorry. <laughs> Just keep it over there. Yeah, I will. Sorry. It's a big foot. They're they are big. They're big feet, real big. <laughs> and big, more to smell. Yeah, yeah, they uh, they throw off quite a waft. <laughs> yes, they do, but <laughs> luckily I've had a fixed nose. I can't smell it that way. Understood. Much. So I want to congratulate you because uh, you and I have been twittering. We have, we yeah. We have indeed. And you were voted funniest man on Twitter. That happened, yeah. That's your life achievement? I hope that you it is. You know isn't. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that would be sad. I mean, it's nice, but if that were the apex. I have kids. So I'm prouder of them. Uh, I have a marriage that requires effort. So those uh -huh. things, <laughs> those things I'm, I'm prouder of. But I don't think anybody cares about those. And they shouldn't because I keep them, you know, private. But who did you beat out to be funniest man on Twitter? Now, here's where the fun stuff comes in. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, Stephen Colbert. Oh, uh, that, well, that's not that fun. <laughs> He's, He's hilarious. Good. He's good. And he's very funny on Twitter because he tweets as himself. He doesn't tweet as his character. Yeah. So he's he's extremely good at that. Uh, Steve Martin, another yeah. Steve. Yeah. Uh, so that, you know, now we're getting to see that maybe the award doesn't mean that much when, in fact, I want it over them. Yeah. Uh, no, Sarah Steve Silverman. So three S's in you. Three S's in me. Do they give you an award? They do, 140 yeah. 140 <laughs> characters on the 140 the tiny awards. No, you, I, it was a shockingly heavy microphone. I have it on my mantle, and if it fell off, it would break f several bones in your foot. Uh, <laughs> it, but you, the funny thing is, is you don't it, you don't get to go get it at the ceremony because the Twitter award. They're like nobody really cares, so we'll give that when the cameras are off, and we'll mail it to you. And they don't even say it on TV, just on their website. They're like, P.S. This schmuck won this. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna mail it to him. And uh, that should be enough for him. But what did you start out to be? You're uh, very smart. You were very well educated. I wanted to do musical theater. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah, I wanted to sing and, and dance. I wanted to be an actor, and I thought, like, oh, you act with your body and your voice. Why don't I train mine the best I can through singing and dancing? And, and that's what I did. And do I, that again. Singing and dancing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> which I love to, I absolutely love to do, but I don't love to do it as much... May I tell a short little anecdote that I think you'll relate well, to? Well, I would say no. You're here for okay. free. All right. Okay. <laughs> I was doing the national tour of Camelot, and I was playing Sir Lancelot. Are you right? serious? Yes. And our set and our crew <laughs> and orchestra and everything got to the venue one night, but our bus with the cast broke down, right? <laughs> and so we had to get another bus. So we got to the theater after there was already 2,500 people in the audience waiting, and we had to do sound check because you have to act, you know, recalibrate the voice of, of the lead actors with the orchestra and stuff. So Guinevere went out, did a little sound check, said some lines of dialogue from the play, sang a few bars. Then Arthur did that. Then I went out and I thought, you know, these people are here to see the play. I don't want to spoil it by saying lines of dialogue. Not that they didn't already know them all anyway, musical theater junkie weirdos in Virginia. Mm -hmm. But I, I went out there and I was like, I'm going to just tell a little bit about my day. And I talked and I just told about my day in a slightly funny way. And people laughed. I heard 2,500 people laugh because of a thing that I thought up and said. And at that point I was like, I don't want to do musical theater anymore. I just want to do comedy. And it was at that moment that I, I thought, okay, I got to got to turn left here and do something different. Do you ever look, though, and say, I'd like to go back and do Sondheim, or, my God, I would kill to do um, I, I, one of some of the great play. Well, Gypsy, you know, it's a woman's oh, yeah. part. Once you do comedy, or once you create anything on your own, that's, and you bleed into it, that's the stuff that you, like, must do. So 
I would love to do a musical, but the fact is I would probably, now that I'm such a despot and a weirdo and have gotten used to writing my own stuff, I'd probably have to write it myself like some jerk and then it would be a big flop. But I prefer to, <laughs> to make up my own stuff because once you get that bug, I mean, that's like the... You also were drunk for a while. Oh, yeah. yeah and yeah. you ended up in jail in a wheelchair, which is in your resume. Yeah, that's on my resume. Yep. Are you hoping to be like hired for lockup? Uh, yeah, Why I can be rolled around in a jail cell. Uh, yeah, that's when I, so that was 11 years ago. I was in a car accident. And a car accident, it was me in a building. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I drove into it. And I don't remember it. I wasn't like, I hate that particular building. But I just, I was very drunk. And I, I, was, in a, I was in a blackout, as I often was in those days. And when I came to and was in the hospital, surrounded by the cops and doctors and stuff, I realized uh, that I didn't, like many a drunk, I didn't care if I died, which that's sad, but we know, we all know somebody like that. But when I figured, like, when they were like, you know you could have killed somebody out there, I was like, you know, you've got a point. And uh, I didn't want to do that. I didn't yeah. want to kill other people. I just want to kill myself, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. like a regular whatever, you know. But uh, once I realized <laughs> I was a menace to society, I thought, oh, I don't want to do that. So that and you just stopped. Me. Yeah, I did. I'd been trying to quit for years. So then once I was in jail in a wheelchair with two broken arms, this is all titanium in here. This is where this wrist was rebuilt. If I take my pants off, you'll puke. And if then I if take I, mine yeah, off, yeah. you will too. So we'll keep going. <laughs> Um, I've but, heard that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, so that I got close enough to like the edge. Like, I feel like I got to the edge and I was like, well, any further than this is death. Right. And I'm not interested in that. So I feel like I kind of exhausted my sort of alcohol and drug opportunities for one lifetime. W were you married at that point? No, I hadn't even met my wife. How lucky. Because otherwise, oh, yeah. my God. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I met her a few years later. And our seventh anniversary is in a few days. So what are you going to get her? Uh, no, nah, nothing. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm going to, we, uh, we'll go out to dinner. And uh, I'm not sure, you know. I, I don't want to, I, I hope it's, a, it's, I feel like saying something sincere here. Maybe it's because I'm meeting an idol of mine and yeah, we're in yeah. a bed. And once the cameras turn off, what we do after that. But I <laughs> am so proud of her. And she's been such a great mother to my kids that uh, I feel like I probably should do something. So I should explore the idea of doing something. Get her a little piece of jewelry or something. That's a good idea. Are, are you on that level that you can do that? A very tiny piece. Yeah. But if I get a, if I get that Anna Jewelers loop, she'll be able to see it because it'll be tiny. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's what I'll do. Thank you. You do a lot of uh, comedy that you get almost in trouble for, which is great. Like Michael Douglas. That that's mm -hmm. where I first really started noticing you. Mm -hmm. Michael Douglas, you know, uh, said he had throat cancer because he had uh, too much. Been going down on women. Been going down HPV. on women and. He thinks either a prostitute or how lucky for him his lovely wife gave it to him. I know. I mean, either but way, she she's upset. He that's the equivalent. What he did is the absolute equivalent of like having an easel with a, like a piece of velvet over it and then rolling it off and having it be like an oil painting of Catherine Zeta Jones and being like she got a dirty pussy. It's the <laughs> same thing. What he did is the same thing. <laughs> No wonder she went back into me. I mean, yeah. So that and but it's a lot of that's such a great subject for comedy because he's Michael Douglas. He's got a body of work that's amazing. He won the Academy Award for producing One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I mean, his he's heroic in his body of work. So we all love him, or at least I do. Then he got it through doing one of my favorite things to do, which is makes it funnier. And then it gave him cancer, which is amazing. You know, I never think of you know. So it's just such a beautiful ingredient. It's like a pizza with all my favorite toppings. I, I I'm, I'm glad he's okay. But I hope he doesn't mind me saying that I'm glad it happened. <laughs> <laughs> what do you talk about in your act? I'm pretty personal. Like, for example, I, uh, as wonderful as I think that Michael Douglas situation is, I wouldn't really talk too much about things that happen in, like, pulp culture, pop culture or politics. I talk more about myself, my family, my body, sex, sexual politics between men and women. Uh, what I'm afraid of, what I dream about. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty personal. I get into my guts because that's where the biggest laughs are. Right. I think. 
Who were your idols, comedy idols as a child? I'll say you, and I won't go into graphic detail because I don't want to embarrass you, but uh, I mean, you're amazing, and to sit here with right, you is right, bullshit. Right, right. Uh, Rodney Dangerfield, who you just mentioned, Hilarious. unreal. I mean, his albums, if you listen to him now, they could have come out next week. Yes. They're so razor sharp. He's amazing. Richard Pryor, I'm crazy about because of the joy that he had, even when he was talking about the most horrible stuff. He was a humanist, and there was kindness, and it just showed. So no matter where he took you, you were, wanted to ride around with him and go there. So he's great. I just saw Bill Cosby quite recently, and he was amazing. Um, amazing. You know, and yeah. all clean family yeah. stuff. Yeah. And it's funny. I see his show is two hours. In those two hours, he told six jokes, and they all adhered to a sort of similar template. They'd be a story that was around 20 minutes or so that was unbelievably detail-rich, and there'd be long stretches where you weren't laughing. Then at the end, he would take his stomach and just his hand and put it in your stomach and just twist your guts and tie it all together and you would almost throw up from laughing it was like unreal seeing him um yeah so did you go idols. backstage and do you go back to people and say I'm a, I'm a fan uh i don't tell this to people but i'll tell it to you because he and i are both with the same agency he heard that i was coming from one of my agents and and he asked me to come back he didn't know who i was so it's not like he's like i want to meet rob delaney i that was not the case but he heard a comedian with the same agency so he had me and my wife back and we talked for 20 minutes before his show and it was amazing i mean i'll never forget it and he was so kind and open about like his process he talked to my wife forever i mean he knew things about the little town she grew up in north carolina i mean it was like you know what? It was the f only time in my life that I can remember. You know how sometimes if you're dreaming and you'll something crazy will be happening, you're like, wait a minute, I'm dreaming. And then like a manatee will fly by in the sky <laughs> and you'll be like, yeah, I'm dreaming. It, when, when I was talking to Bill Cosby or when I was about to go into his dressing room, I was like, I'm dreaming. And then I, but I still, then no manatees flew by. So I was like, I think this is happening. We do things here on this show because mm -hmm. everyone in their childhood uh, either did something to a, a classmate or in mm -hmm. high school that you feel sorry and you'd like to look in there and say, like, oh, wow. Ellen Gossett, I'm sorry, I said your nose job was terrible. Yeah. You know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Up had been mean to my little sister one day and I was like well you can't do that so rather than beat him up I went to the store at the corner and I bought a tube of anchovy paste and I walked back to our neighborhood with the anchovy paste and like walked around the younger kids being like wow this smells great this stuff smells really and they were little kids so they didn't know what anchovy paste was and I was like oh man I'm so fortunate I get to sniff this wonderful anchovy paste so finally he was like let me smell it and I was like are you sure and he's like I know how to smell it and so then he went to smell it and I just squeezed the tube and anchovy paste went up both his nostrils <laughs> and uh, he started gagging and stuff and then I was like don't fuck with my sister um now now i'm not sorry that i did that but i am for humanity because now he works for the government making weapons and uh like he even even like the fbi called my mom a few years ago because he had to get all this super clearance and was like how was he as a kid and she was like he was pretty good except one time but i think my son fixed his wagon so i don't know if like the government you know i mean now that the nsa reads all our emails and stuff you know who knows so but uh, I would like to apologize to my childhood next door neighbor for doing that. Not because you didn't deserve it, Matthew Greenberg, but because I don't want um, you to blow up the world with some type of laser or even do either. Have you heard about the thing that they just send a sound wave and everybody in square miles shits their pants? He might, maybe he works on that. And I don't want, <laughs> I don't think people should do that. Wait, uh, wait, what it was so this? I, so I'm sorry and I'm willing to sacrifice my uh myself even the, though i feel i did the right thing we have melissa in town mm -hmm. and considering this is her house you're in my house she know, would like to you. ask you a few questions oh, if we could absolutely melissa do you know that we play a game mm -hmm. where i'm gonna give you two choices yeah you're gonna pick one mm -hmm. and the other one is gone forever oh okay just basically 
dead, mm -hmm. okay. gone, okay. has never existed, and will never will cease to exist. Okay. Okay. Yes. They're random things. Okay. Your first choice is chocolate or vanilla. Uh, I I pick chocolate. Vanilla gone forever. Why? Chocolate, uh, you know, they say how it like operates on our brain the same way sex does. The older I get, the more I believe that. Because once you get older, <laughs> you can't fuck everything that you see, so you just have to stuff chocolate into your body. And chocolate satisfies me sexually when I put it in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Model or stripper? <sighs> um, a lot of crossover there. Uh, the, the Venn diagram of the two is, we get blurry. I mean, I suppose model, because you're probably less likely to have semen thrown at you at work. You know, that's like less, <laughs> less of an occupational hazard. So the model stays or goes? I think, I think the model stays and the stripper goes because I want, like, I'm, when I see a thing that is two people that can be women, I think, am I spending time with them? Are they my wife or my sister? I suppose the sort of mental health level of a model versus a stripper is maybe just a Click higher, just a little. Ginger or Marianne? Oh, for me, Marianne. Stays. Stays, and Ginger goes. Because Ginger, like, I, I'm sorry to go sexually immediately, but I feel like Ginger would be like, yeah, whatever. And, and so you wouldn't have to really work for it, but to convince Marianne to, like, go behind the professor's shed or whatever, you'd have to really work for it, so it'd feel more worth it. So Marianne stays, <laughs> Ginger goes. <laughs> That was great. I love the logic. <laughs> I love the life. I just love hearing the thought process. <laughs> we always end our show, we all applaud, and then we ask you to do the clapper to turn us off. Oh, okay. fun. Okay. Yeah. So everybody, really Rob Delaney. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And now if you would do the double clap. I just finished my time in bed with Joan. Uh, as you can see, there's a sheen about me, a glow. That's because I enjoyed myself, uh, and I had an honest experience with a woman that I admire. We all know Rob Delaney has been picked the number one king of tweets. So, here is a 140 character tweet just for him. <clears throat> Rob Delaney, the king of Twitter, is one of the funniest and smartest. Here is my advice to make him a big star. Rob, listen carefully. Here is the k 140. Let me know who you'd like to see in bed with me. You can do it by sending me a message on Facebook or Twitter. <laughs>